sorry. Someone took my stairs. Well, thank you uh, to all the musicians here this morning. Thank you, Joan, and thank you. Um, certainly uh, a blessing to be able to have as many instruments up there this morning, uh, all playing and uh, doing some of the, the great old hymns of the faith. This morning we are in Mark chapter 5, and I'd ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. I'd like to read for you um, much of our text here uh, that we'll be considering here today. And uh, I'm going to actually be reading from the New King James here uh, because I forgot my Bible. Um, I mean, seriously, I'm human too. <laughs> Did I mention we're taking care of our grandkids? <laughs> and that, that just may have something to do with it. <laughs> I put in there my planner, which is about the same size as my Bible, and I went back and said, you cannot preach out of a planner, Kevin. Uh, and so I've stolen Karen's Bible, and so let's all stand as we read Mark chapter 5 here this morning. Uh, a little bit different, uh, some of the wording, uh, New King James uh, versus the New American Standard. But in verse 1, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I, do, have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Father, we thank you that truly this morning as we explore the power of our great God, that today, Father, we uh, truly acknowledge your power over all things. And we thank you, Father, that truly as we come to you with faith and trust, Lord, that you have the power not only to deliver us from our sin. But Father, you have the power to give to us eternal life in a resurrected body one day. And we just thank you, Father, for the precious promises that you've made. For we know, Lord, that you have the power to follow through with each one of those precious promises. Guide us, Lord, now as we explore this passage. Help us, Father, to understand uh, significant points here that you desire for us to, to really put into our hearts today. We thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. Well, last Sunday we talked about the amazing miracle in Mark chapter 4 when Jesus is there asleep in the rear of the boat and uh, as he's sleeping there, this huge storm comes up and it's pummeling the boat to the point where the water is coming over the sides of the boat and the boat is about ready to sink. It was a dreadful, dreadful storm. And as we think of the storm that he dealt with, he was able then to calm the sea. And the disciples were absolutely amazed. In fact, if you look back at Mark 4, 41, it says, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is ricocheting around in their hearts and minds. For truly, Jesus' power over nature was extraordinary. He was able to tame the fury of nature and what the storms were because God is in control of all of these things. And today we look at Jesus' power over the most powerfully created being in the universe, that is Lucifer, uh, Satan as we would know him, our great adversary, the one who tried to usurp the power of Almighty God. And it is true that Jesus is more powerful than even Satan. So we're thankful today as we come to this passage of Scripture for the deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus Christ is more powerful than any force on this planet. Well, from the perspective of the disciples, this was a very, very interesting time. This was an amazing, amazing turn of events. They had gone from standing on the, uh, the, the crowd, standing on the seashore while the disciples are in the boats with Jesus. 
and they're there, and Jesus is teaching, and as Jesus is teaching, they're, they're thinking to themselves, this has been a pretty long day. And Jesus says, let's go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, six point some miles from that point to that point. And as they went across, you know the story, the storm came up, and they feared for their very lives, and Jesus stomped that storm and allowed the winds to, to just blow themselves out and immediately become calm. And they were blown away, no pun intended, by the miracle of Jesus. It was an amazing event. And now they're thinking to themselves, all we need to do is cross over. Maybe it's only two or three more miles. Maybe it's less than that. And we'll get to the other side. And by the time we get to the other side, we can finally have some type of relief and some type of vacation. Here we are. It's July 29th. It is the peak of vacation time, isn't it? Woohoo! You're all not on vacation. It's all those empty seats. Those are the people that are on vacation. You're a disciple. You're thinking to yourself, I just can't wait to get to the other side of this shoreline. This is going to be exciting. I can rest. Have you ever gone on vacation and it's not turned out like you planned? <laughs> Some vacations just don't turn out like you plan. I remember back in 1986, and I know that's a long time ago, we went on vacation with some friends. We rented this place near the beach. It was cold and rainy most of the week, I think. But it's always cold and rainy on vacation up there. So we went to uh, this cottage, and they had a very young family. In fact, our son was about three years old at the time, or two years old, or one year old. Maybe he was less than one year old, now that I'm doing the math. I'm not sure why we took him. We should have left him home. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this place was, was not really well equipped for two families. Um, they got a nice room and a nice suite with their little one, and we had, uh, well, we had a little room. And um, there was a futon in the middle of the floor in, in the living room, and that's what I was going to sleep on. Uh, biggest problem with that is our friends like to stay up. You know, remember Johnny Carson and all that? Yeah. And I, I go to bed at 10 o'clock or 9.30 or 9 and I had to wait until everyone went to sleep at night. And then Davey would get up really early in the morning. And oftentimes Karen would take him out and just drive him around town. Or I drove him around town too. And, you know, you just did whatever you could. He was colicky and he wasn't happy to be there. And I thought to myself, when will this vacation ever end? <laughs> and then it got worse. Their car broke down. It was blowing oil the whole time they were there. And we had to take them car shopping in the middle of vacation, in the middle of the rain. And so we had two families in a four-door sedan, and it was exciting. <laughs> I am so glad that that vacation ended when it did. You see, sometimes things don't turn out, and this is one of those times for the disciples where things just really don't turn out like they plan. They're on their way across the Sea of Galilee. Now, I want you to put yourself into, into the mode of the, that time period. Uh, the storm happens at night, the Bible tells us, and so we know it's pitch black, and we know that the Bible tells us that the sea just drops right out and it is flat calm. I mean, it is absolutely calm. It was very, very rough, and it was tough to survive. But when Jesus calms the sea, the amazing thing happens. It goes absolutely flat, glass calm. Now, picture yourself. You're in the boat with Jesus. It's pretty dark. And you're rowing across the Sea of Galilee. And there's no wind. You can't hear anything except the oars in the water. Shoo. 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 And if anybody ever says anything, if you've ever been on the water at night, especially when it's flat calm, the word travels, doesn't it? I've heard people talking. It's like you and I talking here. And they're a half a mile away. Well, Jesus knew about it, but the disciples did not. And so isn't this wonderful, this backdrop that they built just for this message this morning? I think it has something to do with VBS tomorrow. But you can imagine the hillside, can't you? And we're coming up to the hillside in the boat. And while they're coming across that water, there is a man filled with demons, and he can hear the oars in the water. Now, the Bible says here, we just got through reading it, all day long, he would cry out and scream. Uh, constantly is the word that's used in the New American Standard. He was constantly doing that. All night long, 
he would be making sounds. But maybe this night, as he's listening to the oars coming through the water, he's thinking to himself, who's coming? And he's listening intently, and as the boat pulls up on the shore, he makes his introduction. Notice what happens here, and put yourself in the place of the disciples, because this is a a crazy night. When they came to the other side of the sea, they were in the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, that is Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. When the Bible talks about an unclean spirit, it's speaking there of demonic activity, someone who's indwelt by demons or a demon. This man, as the Bible describes him, is a a very interesting man. He had his dwelling among the tombs. There were caves that were into the side of that area of the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't suitable for living up there. And so these caves were just natural places to place dead bodies. And you would put the body in there and entomb that body there. And what would happen is this man, because he is not in his right mind, would go in there and he would dwell there. Well, the people evidently wanted to subdue him. They wanted to make sure that he was not a difficulty to deal with. And so they had gone out on numerous occasions and they had sought to control him even to the point where they were chaining him up. They were putting chains on him with shackles and so forth. And the problem was that he was able then to exercise an enormous supernatural amount of strength and break through those chains. He was loud. He's hollering all day long and all night long. Verse 5, night and day in the mountains, in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. Here is this man. He's not in his right mind because of the unclean spirits that are dwelling within him. He's powerful. You would look at that man and you would be fearful of this man. Now, biblically, there's some interesting applications here, or not applications, but just uh, side parallels. If we look at some of the other gospel writers, Matthew 8, 28 notes that there were two men, but Mark just focuses here on the one. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 27, the Bible tells us that he was naked. He hadn't put on clothing for a very long period of time. In chapter 8, it also says that he had been driven out by the demons into the desert area. Matthew 8, 28, he was extremely violent, so violent that no one could pass by. You're starting to get the image of who this man was. This man is out of his mind. He's a raging lunatic, and he is so off the hook that no one wants to encounter this person. They would hear him screaming at night and think to themselves, oh, this is terrible to go to sleep listening to this. What can we do? They would chain him up, put shackles on him, and he would break through, and he would tear to pieces the shackles. He had that much strength, that much supernatural strength in his body. I'm sure everybody had heard about this fellow. I'm sure the disciples probably had heard about it. And I'm sure they were glad when they were eight miles away on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And now they're thinking to themselves, as they pull up on shore and Jesus gets out of the boat and this madman rushes down to them, they're no doubt, they're thinking to themselves, oh no, we need to leave. We need to get out of here. Can you imagine what it must have been like that morning as it's just a little dark still and this man comes running down? And as he comes down, it's a different reaction that he encounters because he's encountering someone that he's never encountered before. He's encountering Jesus, the mighty son of God. Notice what it says here. It tells us that when he had come down, he saw Jesus from afar in verse 6. He ran down and he worshipped him. He cried out with a loud voice, What have I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? This demon-possessed man comes running down and Jesus is there standing on the shore and he acknowledges in front of the disciples that Jesus is truly the son of the mighty God. He is truly in every essence God himself 
And because he is God, because he is capable of bringing to bear the final judgment, this man was very, very concerned. And he asked that question, what have I to do with you? Make no misunderstanding here. The demons and Satan understand the final outcome. They know that they're going to be judged. I believe they're very aware that their final resting place will be in the lake of fire. I believe that they understand that that day is coming. They just don't know when that day is going to appear. So when they saw Jesus, most naturally they thought to themselves, oh no, maybe it's over for us. Maybe Jesus is going to cast us into the abyss. Maybe this is going to be the very end. Very concerned about this as they come to his, this man comes to Jesus. Jesus turns to him. And this is where you see the, the demons and the, the powerful rejection. You see the demons were many. And Jesus is going to ask them, after he tells him to come out of the man, unclean spirit, he says, what is your name? And the man looked at Jesus and said, our name is Legion because there are so many of us living in this man. That's a pretty scary thought to know and understand that unclean spirits can indwell the life of a human being, but it's true, isn't it? Now, don't get worried this morning if you have faith in Jesus Christ and greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world and you are truly sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God himself and there is no possibility for you to be controlled by an unclean spirit. Isn't that a relief? Yes. What is our biggest enemy? Well, Galatians would tell us that we need to be filled with the Spirit of God and allow the Spirit of God to control us. Our biggest enemy is the sins of the flesh. You see, oftentimes our flesh will push off the Holy Spirit of God and not allow the Spirit of God to control us. But the one thing we don't have to worry about is the forces of Satan coming and dwelling within us. And we can deal with the, the forces of Satan. And we live in a world that we see the forces of Satan all around us all the time don't we? And he can come and he can seek to oppress the believer, but he cannot possess us. He cannot live within us. There is limitations that Satan has when it comes to the child of the king. Jesus looks at this man and he says, what's your name? God knows all things, doesn't he? When he said legion, you think of the legion, you think of a, a Roman army. Do you know how many people, how many soldiers were part of a legion? 6,000. 6,000. I don't know if there were 6,000 or not in them. There were a lot. And the Bible tells us that he is going to plead with Jesus over what is going to be the outcome here. Notice verse 10. He begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now that's a, a question that they had. They were very, very concerned all of these demons within him, don't send us out. They didn't want to be pushed out, but we would see that that is exactly what Jesus' intention is, for Jesus has already commanded them to come out of the man. It is not a question of the demons wrestling with Jesus over whether or not this was going to happen. It was going to happen. The only question at all was, where are they going to end up? And the Bible tells us that Jesus gives him permission to be able to go into the swine. And so there on a hill, there's a herd of swine. Pigs. You know, pork chops, bacon. Remember, this is an area of the Gadareans that is not Jewish. This is Gentile country. He's going to mention the Decapolis at the end of this chapter section here. That is Gentile country. These people perhaps heard of Jesus, but they're not conditioned in understanding the same things that the Jewish people were, and they're certainly not under the obligations of the law. These were, in the Jewish mindset, unclean animals, and so a Jew would have no problem with these demons going off into these swine, but for the Gentiles, this was kind of their livelihood. And so here's what happens. 
We find them begging Jesus, send us into the swine that we may enter into, verse 13, and at once Jesus gave them permission. And then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There's about 2,000 swine, the Bible tells us. So we would say that there's at least 2,000 demons resting in this man. Isn't that horrible? And the Bible says the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Did you catch that? Now understand this, it's not Jesus who killed the swine, is it? Who, who killed the swine? The demons. The demons caused them to run down, and the demons caused them to jump off the cliff. The demons caused them to drown at the bottom or be killed by the fall. Once they were in those animals and those animals had perished, the demons would be free to do what? Kind of like the commercial, move about the country, right? They could leave. They could go off into other things. They could seek to indwell someone else. If someone else's heart and life was open to uh, such occupation, they could get a a handheld uh, there in that soul and they could migrate into that other person. Maybe they would go in different directions. It's difficult to say. I don't exactly know what happened, but I know that their uh, intention was to go into those swine and then run down that cliff and basically be free to go off into something else. So when that happens, there are people who are observing this. And this is leading us to our next point. His power and his greatness leads us uh, to acceptance or rejection. Notice in Mark, or Matthew chapter 8.33, I'll just say this. In Matthew 8.33, you don't have to turn there, but it says there uh, that the herdsmen who were there reported absolutely everything to the townspeople when they went back. So those in verse 14 who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and the country. They went out to see then what had happened. So here's where the interesting parts start to occur. Because what we begin to see here is nothing but fascinating to me. Those who fed the swine, the herdsmen, go back in, tell the townspeople what happened, and then they came immediately out to see what happened. Now the sun's up, the morning's bright, it's a nice day, I'm assuming. And the Bible says uh, when they came out, they came to Jesus. Then they came to Jesus, verse 15, and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, these spirits, living within him. And I want you to see exactly how he is portrayed now. And I want you to think in your mind what we're contrasting this with. He is, first of all, the Bible says, uh, he's sitting. He's sitting. Now, that might not seem like a big deal. He's finally sitting down. This is the guy who's a raging lunatic. You remember the Tasmanian devil in the cartoons? Remember that guy? I mean, he was always, and, and that's the, the, the idea you get with this fellow. He just won't sit down. I mean, he is just a raving man. He is all the time loud, and he, he doesn't make any sense, and he's, he's violent, and he's powerful, and he's so scary. I hope I never meet anyone like this. There he is. He's sitting. And even though the gospel writer tells us he hadn't worn clothes in a very long time. Someone gave him some clothes. He's sitting. He's wearing clothes. You don't have to turn away. You can look him in the eye and realize that he's a regular person. The Bible tells us he's sitting, he's clothed, and he is in his right mind. sitting there with a cup of coffee, talking to the disciples. Jesus has already told them who he is. You know, because after all, uh, you know, uh, so they said, you, the, the demons in me said you are the son of the mighty God. What does that mean? And Jesus says, well, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then the Caterian says, that's me. And, and I'm sure this is just really an amazing event. And the disciples are finally sitting there going, Whew, you know what I mean? I mean, it has been one of those nights. 
This has been a ridiculous event. And now we're sitting here, and, and this, this former raving lunatic is sitting there, and he's, he's as normal as I am, John is thinking. And Peter's thinking, this is really cool. Look what has happened in this man's life. His life has been absolutely transformed. And the reaction of the townspeople is curious at best. Notice your text there. And they were praising the Lord. They came down, they saw this man sitting, clothed, in his right mind, and they praised Jesus. I know, I got a strange version here. But it says, and they were afraid. They were afraid. So out of the hills he comes. Don't you love this illustration? There's the, the mountainside. He was up there in the caves. He came running down. He encountered Jesus. And now they're sitting over here under a little uh, cabana. And uh, Jesus is teaching them. And uh, it is just a wonderful experience. But the townspeople have the most curious reaction. They were phobia, the original Greek word there. They were terrified to the point where they didn't want Jesus to even be there. Does that make sense to you? I just asked you the honest question. Does that make any sense to you? You just got to go with it. It doesn't make sense to me either. I would just so naturally think that they would be excited. That finally, this is the person, let, let's rewind a little bit. This is the person who they would go out there in no doubt big groups. You know, like, okay, let's take 20 of our strongest men. Let's go out there and we're going to tackle this guy. And when we get him down, we're going we're gonna to chain him up. Okay, we're going to finally deliver ourselves from this, this, this terrible thing that's been going on. And, they, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, if I had that kind of strength, I would just, like, let you chain me. Like, you could just come. Come on, chain me. Go ahead, chain me. <laughs> chain me. Come on, who's got the guts? Come up, chain me. <laughs> and they'd chain me, and I'd go, watch this. Boom. Finally, it's over. He's sitting there. Maybe use a little more cream and sugar, but this is good coffee. He's in his right mind, and they're terrified. I thought you were afraid before of this man. Well, why aren't you celebrating? Why aren't you excited about it? What we have in front of us is a microcosm of how the world comes to Jesus today. Look at what Christ has accomplished in this world. Look at what his church has done. Look at the wonder of wonders, the transformed lives of people like you and me, who if we weren't transformed, our hearts would be internally like the demoniac. We would be against God and against humanity quite potentially, wouldn't we? Look at all the hospitals that Christians have built. Look at all of the missions of mercy and salvation army and on and on and on that Christianity has done. And yet those who reject Jesus Christ reject him completely and want nothing to do with him. Maybe you have come to a place of faith and you've gone back to your family and God's changed your life. And your family looks at you and says, we don't want anything to do with God. Yeah, but, but, but I was this way, and now I'm like this. And it doesn't make any sense to you why they would reject you. And you need to understand that they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus Christ. Just like these townspeople wanted nothing to do with Jesus. But the story doesn't end here, and it doesn't end with these townspeople either. Notice with me here in this passage that while the townspeople are going to reject Jesus, the Bible says, and those who saw it told them how it happened, who had been, the man had been demon-possessed, and they told them all about the swine, and they pled with Jesus to depart. So that's the end of that part. 
When Jesus gets into the boat in verse 18, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. There is, as we look at the power that motivates us to share the love of Jesus, we see in this man a motivation to stay with Jesus. One of the biggest problems that Jesus encountered, and it goes all the way back to the time where John is baptizing and, and Jesus is there and he's dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees. And I've, I've mentioned it a number of times in the past, but the biggest problem was the self-righteousness of the people. The self-righteousness of people keep people from repenting of their sin. Self-righteousness is the huge obstacle. And here we are among Gentiles. We've already been quite critical of the Jewish leaders and said that they were clinging to their self-righteousness, which was an accurate and is still an accurate statement. However, now we're dealing with Gentiles. And do you know what? The Gentiles have the same problem the Jews had, and that is their self-righteousness. When this man looked at his life, the man who had the demons, he looked at his life and he did not say to himself, oh, I am so wonderful and I've done this all on my own. He looked at Jesus and he recognized that he did not have any righteousness of his own. But rather he is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and by faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus has transformed his world. Jesus has transformed his life. The townspeople looked at themselves and said, we're good enough. We're not like this raving lunatic. Uh, Jesus, why don't you, are disrupting thing. I mean, look at all these floating swine. We, you know, we've got a lot of butchering to do. I'm sure that they went down into the water and grabbed all those swine right out of the water, brought them back to town, butchered them, and, and tried to, to make use out of them as best as they could. They didn't want Jesus complicating things anymore. It would be difficult for them to understand that it wasn't Jesus who killed the swine, but it was the demons who did, but that's another story. Here's this man whose life has been transformed, and he is willing to leave everything, granted it's not a lot, that he possesses at that point, but he just loves Jesus. He just loves Jesus, and he just wants to follow Jesus. And that's why when he comes to him, he's begging Jesus, he's beseeching Jesus, he's imploring Jesus is the term that's used in the New American Standard. He says he's imploring Jesus that he might be with him. He's, he's thinking to himself, the last one I want to see leave is you, Jesus. I, I want to be with you because his life was transformed and everything had become new. Notice over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Much more accurately translated, don't be deceived. We can deceive ourselves to think that the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God. He says, do not be deceived, fornicators, adulterers, adulterers homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, they're not going to inherit kingdom of God. Then he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, he says. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Your life's been changed. This is the case with the demoniac. His life's been changed. This is one of those grand testimonies have you ever listened to the, the radio program, Unshackled Pacific Garden Mission? And someone shares a testimony, and they always get the, the people that have the most dramatic testimonies to share on that radio program. And you're listening, and I love the background sounds and the music, and it's just so awesome to hear how God has transformed life. Now, I just want to stop you right there in, in your process of thinking. But every single one of us who has come to faith in Jesus Christ has had our life transformed. We have become washed in the blood of Christ, we're sanctified, justified, and now our role is totally changed in life. Our goal in life is to glorify God. Hallelujah. Amen. Rather than live for ourselves, it's all about living now for God. So Jesus turns to the demoniac, the former demoniac, and he says that Jesus wouldn't let him get in the boat, but said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. 
I don't need you to come with me. You stay here. And you be a testimony to those in your family and in your community. You, you go back, and can you imagine what this man, his reception would have been like when he came walking back into town? Quick, close the doors, get inside. <laughs> Guess who's coming back? The implication is huge. In fact, later on in Jesus' ministry, Jesus will go to the Decapolis, where this man is from, and there will be great groups of people who will come and hear Jesus speak and teach. And you wonder if the testimony of this man's changed life has such an impact on that community that that community now is open to the teaching of Jesus Christ, which I suspect is exactly what happened. There is power in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you can see it lived out in the life of, and it's very dramatic, in the life of this demoniac. But understand this, there is power in your testimony, giving the testimony of the greatness of God in the community and among the family members and the friends that you have. The same gospel of Jesus Christ that transformed that demoniac's life is waiting to transform other people's lives today, people that we know, people that we pray for, people that we share the love of Christ with. God is doing that work, is he not? You and, have, you and I have so much to praise God for. Remember, God is greater than the fury of nature. We learned that last time with a great demonstration of God's power on the Sea of Galilee. But he's also greater than the extreme power of Satan. I mean, you can't muster up anymore, Satan. If you had 70,000 people who are unclean and these demonic spirits indwelling in this man... When Jesus said, come out, they were coming out. There was no question about that. Because of the power of God, the awesomeness of God, he is worthy to be praised and worthy to be shared with the world. Is it not true? And so here is this demoniac struggling in life, and Jesus has compassion on him. How wonderful that was, and how powerful that testimony in his own community. Would you bow your heads with me, please, for just a moment? You might be here this morning, and you might recognize today the need to share your testimony with the world. You might be here, and you might be thinking to yourself, I know that I need to be that light in the dark place. Jesus had just gotten through teaching parables, and he was teaching parables about not hiding our light under a, a, a bushel basket, but lifting it up so that the world might see. Here's this man, and he goes, and he shares Christ. I wonder, are you here today? And you recognize the importance of giving forth the testimony that God has given you? Would you do that? Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I want to have the boldness and the strength to share my testimony with others. I want to share the love of Jesus Christ. That's what he was going to do. This demoniac was going to go back and tell the, the, the world how loving Jesus was to him. He was going to tell them all about his great compassion. I wonder if you're here this morning with me, say, God, give me strength and give me a burning desire in my heart to share the love of Christ with others. Just slip up your hand if I can pray for you as I pray for myself. Slip up your hand this morning if God's speaking your heart about this. Amen. Amen. And I trust that if you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Christ, that today you would give serious thought to that. For truly it is the difference in your eternal destination. We have folks at the front. If you'd like to talk with someone, you'd like to have a word of prayer with someone, you maybe have some questions, they're here They'd love to talk to you this morning. Let's all stand as we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love of Jesus. Lord, we know that Jesus knew that demoniac was there. He knew he'd come running down the hill when he heard the boat. And Jesus was prepared to meet him. Jesus was prepared to deliver him. 
and change his life forever. Father, we thank you for the love of Jesus Christ. May it motivate us today, if we've never placed faith in Christ, to do just that. Knowing that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, took upon himself the sin of the whole world, including mine. If I will but put my faith and trust in him and call on his name, I can be saved. Lord, I thank you for that message. Work in our hearts today. Bless these who've asked for prayer, Lord. May we be moved with compassion towards the world around us and willing to share the love of Christ effectively by sharing our own personal testimony of deliverance from sin. Work in and through your church today, I pray, Father. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Just something to remember. Uh, be in prayer for VBS as VBS starts tomorrow night or tomorrow day and ends Friday night. So uh, if you would remember that, that would be great. Let me just encourage you this morning, if you're visiting with us here today, it's great to have you. If you go out to the visitor's uh, area there, the, the, what am I looking for? What word? The booth, okay, the booth out there in the foyer. Uh, you can exchange a gift, uh, a, you can exchange a card. If you fill out a card, you can exchange that for a gift bag. How's that? That's pretty cool. And I think it has chocolate in it. And so that's a good reason to go. And you can also grab a cup of coffee and go off. We have uh, three uh, adult Bible fellowship classes this morning that you can be a part of as well. And so we'll be starting those uh, in approximately 10 minutes or so. So uh, God bless you. And God give you just a great week.